Hey, I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, lead pastor at the Agape Family Worship Center. We pray this message and resource will stir up your affections for Jesus and encourage you in your calling. Use this resource in conjunction with you belonging to a local church that is helping to shape and shepherd you in Jesus Christ. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at Agape? You can visit us at agapekman.ky slash giving to see how you can do that. Again, we pray this blesses, encourages, and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I am excited this morning to share the message with you. We are uh, in our last message in Relentless. Like I said, I didn't intend for this to be a series at all. I just preached one sermon uh, that the Lord had gave me, and every week since that, the Lord has just been speaking to me uh, in in relation to this this, this topic in terms of his relentless pursuit of us. We started this series off uh, talking about Jacob and how God pursued Jacob and how he had to wrestle with God and what a, what a weird story that is. I, I don't know if you find that story weird, but I find that story weird. If someone was reading the Bible for the first time and they just kind of come in and they get there to this, this part of Genesis and here and, you know, we've got this story of this guy who's running, he's been deceiving his family, his brother, uh, and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, he is, you know, Go, trying to reconcile with his brother, but he's fearing for his life, for his family, and then God comes out of nowhere and just starts wrestling in him. I mean, it's just, it's a strange story. Then we talked about Hosea and Gomer, and what a strange story that is in the Bible, where here it is, we've got uh, Hosea, who is a prophet, and God says to Hosea, hey, Hosea, I, I want you to go and marry a prostitute. I want you to go and marry a, a, a prostitute, and you're going to have kids with her, and your kids are going to be children of prostitution, or, or as the Bible says, children of whoredom. And it's this really interesting story, and it's really only the first three chapters uh, of the book of Hosea that covers his relationship with her. But it's interesting because God uses that relationship to talk about the kind of relationship that Israel has with him and how Israel has, has treated God and the way that, that they've gone about that. Yet God continues to pursue Israel regardless of the way that they have uh, disregarded their relationship, the way that they have disregarded his love Yet he continues to pursue them. He continues to chase after them. And last week we talked about Jonah. Again, you know, Jonah is one of those great stories that we like to tell in Sunday school. But if you think about it, it's a bit, it's a bit strange. Why? Because here's a guy who gets swallowed by a whale. And, and while, you know, that isn't a common thing to happen, it has happened even in modern times. Where uh, this guy was out uh, in, in the ocean, obviously, and, and, and a whale just kind of came up and swallowed him. And just that was it. And spit him out again later. And Jonah has this story, and Jonah's story is incredible because of the way that Jonah is. Jonah's kind of different from a lot of the, uh, the other prophets and people that we see because of Jonah's attitude and the way he approaches God, the way that he approaches uh, the ministry and the purpose that God has for his life because Jonah hates what God has called him to. God calls him to go to Nineveh and tell the people of Nineveh, repent, so that God will spare you, and Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh to tell these people, repent, so that God will spare you. He wants God to judge them and destroy them, which is part of the reason why he ran. And yet God, in his grace and mercy, did not allow Jonah to escape the purpose that God had for his life and escape what God was calling him to do so that the people of Nineveh could receive the mercy and the grace of God and come to repentance. And, and, and I don't know about you, but, but man, that message has just been riding me all week long. It has just really been in my mind, and it has just really, uh, someone was telling me this morning, they said, Pastor, that cut me deep. And, uh, and, and for me as well, as I, as I just 
look back at that message. I wrote that message. It doesn't happen every week, but, but and, and I'll be honest, as much as I say I'm not a big crier, the Lord wrecks me, man. Sometimes I'm just, I'm writing sermons, and as I'm writing them, as I'm reading my Bible, like God's just giving you revelation. I don't know if you've experienced this, and as you're reading it, as you're studying, as you're writing the sermon, it's just like God's just doing something, and you're just in tears at the mercy and grace of God. And I find myself more and more finding myself in that position where I'm just in tears because God is just speaking, God is just moving, he's just touching my heart as he reveals his word. And, and I really just encourage you, that, that doesn't happen every time I read the Bible. Let me just make that clear. But, but what I do find is that the more I pursue him, the more those things become commonplace in my life. And that hasn't been the case for, I don't even know how long I've been walking with the Lord. That hasn't been the case all these years. As a matter of fact, as I've shared with you before, one of my first books to read, the very first book of the Bible that I read from chapter 1 to the end was the book of Revelation. And boy, was that a mistake because, I, I mean, I, I was convinced that Jesus was coming back, the Antichrist was going to just take over everything, and I was going to be beheaded next week. Like, like that was my fear, and I was a teenager, and, and I'm just like, this is, this is the end. And, and I had to go, I was, I was like, Dad, what's going on? And my father had to talk me down because I was just, I was panicking. And, and so that's not a good book to start with if you're considering starting to read your Bible. Don't start with the book of Revelation. Start with one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That's just your, your friendly pastorly advice this morning. But this morning as we're talking, we're going to talk about how God's pursuit of us and, and his relentless pursuit of us transforms us. And, and really this is key to this whole process because no matter how much we talk about his grace, his mercy, his love, and, and how amazing those things are, those things, when we encounter them, never leave us the same. The reason that you are saved, if you're a Christian today, is because when you encountered his grace and mercy, it did something to you, and it changed you, it transformed you, it sanctified you, it made you more holy, it, it, it did something in you. And as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that it is the loving kindness of God that draws us to repentance. Not his judgment, not his wrath, but his loving kindness, his mercy draws us to, his, to repentance. And because of this, it causes us to be transformed. And none of us are the same when we come into God's presence. None of us leave the same when we spend time with him, whether that's time in prayer, whether that's time in the word, whatever it is we, we do, time in worship, when we are in God's presence, it transforms our lives. And that's why we want to continue to go into his presence so that we might meet him, know him, and be transformed by him. Why is this important? Because God has a vision for your life. God knows who he's made you to be, who he's called you to be, what purpose he has in store for you, and the things that he wants to do in you and through you. But a part of God's vision for your life is how God is going to transform you because God has to mold you and make you into what he wants you to be in order for you to fulfill the vision that he has for your life. Now, now about this, this sometimes kind of weirds people out. And the reason why it weirds people out is because we think that when God gets a hold of our lives, that any semblance of our personality and who we are just ceases to exist. That's, that's not the case. God made us the way he made us. You are uniquely you because God made you to be uniquely you. But in that process, he adjusts things about who we are that it becomes more of who we were actually created to be, not who we have become as a result of our sinful nature. And so God's goal is to transform you to look more like Christ to look more like Jesus, to be a reflection of Jesus. And in that process, there are things that God takes out of your life. Like, for instance, some of us, our personalities changed after we became a Christian. Why? Because we needed to be saved from our personalities. Some of us, we, the, the habits that we had had to absolutely be changed because we had to be saved from our habits. The things that we would do, the way that we would talk, the, the interactions that we would have with people, the, the way that we lived had to be transformed in order for us to fulfill 
the, the purpose, the plan, the vision that God has for our life. And so a part of God's vision for your life is not just that you would do something, but that you would be transformed by him. And as you are transformed, or, or, or sorry, as he pursues you, he pursues you in order that you might be transformed. And so I want to point out some things to you this morning through the story of Jeremiah. And while Jeremiah's story is probably not as weird as some of the, the, the other people we've looked at, and it's probably not sort of out of the box in that same kind of way, Jeremiah has a strange story because if you, well, just read the book of Jeremiah. It, it, his life is really this, this conundrum of, of suffering and, and, and just the purpose of God. He wants to do the will of God, but he's struggling to want to do the will of God because it's so hard. Jeremiah is one of those people, he's known as the weeping prophet. He, his book uh, that he writes in, in connection to the book of Jeremiah is also the book of Lamentations, to lament. Jeremiah, if you read his life, I mean, he, just, he goes through hell. He goes through suffering. He goes through weeping and mourning. And he really, really, really struggles with some of what God has called him to do. Yet he still has a desire in him to fulfill the work and the purpose of God. And as we talk today, we're going to be looking a little bit at, at his story, but also one of the things that God speaks to him to show him and reveal to him how he wants to transform not just Jeremiah's life, but the entire nation of Israel and how he wants to transform me and you today. And the first thing that we need to know about this is that God's purpose for your life is specific. God's purpose for your life is specific. You know, we, we tend to talk in generalities a lot. You know, we, we tend to talk about sort of just these ethereal things that are just kind of out there. They're, they're not specific. We, we talk about life in terms of, of just sort of generic kind of conversations with people. You know, you've got the, the phrase, I love you. If someone comes to you and they say to you, I love you, that's a very specific thing that they're telling you. They're telling you certain things, and, and, and obviously different people uh, are, are different. When, when we tell people we love them, we mean different things. So some people, when they say, I love you, what they mean is something slightly different than what someone else says. Like, for instance, if I tell you that I love you, and I tell my wife that I love her, do I mean the same thing? No, I do not. I hope you know that. <laughs> I love you, but I don't love you the way I love my wife. It's important to make that distinction. Now, while that might be common sense, if my wife thinks that I love you the way that I love her, that's going to be problematic for my marriage. And if you think that I love you the way that I love my wife, that's going to be problematic for my marriage. And so when we say it, we might mean different things. But imagine you say to someone, I love you, and their response to you is, I think you're nice too. That, that's, that's, that's kind of brutal, isn't it? But here, here's what's happening there, is that there's one person who is very specific about the way that they feel about someone, and someone on the other hand who's being very general about the way they feel about someone. And because of that, it creates a conflict. And we have a tendency to speak in generalities a lot, maybe not from that perspective of I love you or I think you're nice, but, but from the perspective of that we don't recognize that the purpose that God has for us and the purpose that he has for our life is very, very specific. God isn't just looking at your life and going, well, this is a nice general thing for me to call. You have a general call, but you also have a specific call. There are two types of calls that God has on all of our lives. The general call is Matthew chapter 28, that we would go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
The, the general call is that you would love your neighbor as yourself. The general call is that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and might and love our neighbor as ourselves. That, that's the great commandment. Those are general things that God has called us to do. But the way in which that is lived out is specific to you and me. And God does not just create a general plan or purpose for your life, but he has a specific one. He knows exactly where he wants you to be. He knows exactly what he wants you to do. He knows exactly the plan and the purpose for your life. Every detail of your life is written out before God, and every plan and purpose that he has for your life is written out in explicit detail. Here's our problem. God doesn't tell us the specific details. That's our problem. You, you ever felt like God's called me to something, God's called me to more, but I just don't know what it is. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's a frustrating place to be sometimes, but the reality is, is that even though God calls us to these things, we have to be careful because we have to understand this purpose or this point that his purpose for us is specific, but it is his purpose, not our purpose. And because it is his purpose, he needs to know the plan. I have a very specific plan and purpose for my children. But if my children ask me, what is that plan, Daddy? I'm going to tell them something general. I want you to grow up to be good people. I want you to know how to be compassionate and loving towards others. I, I want you to be respectful. And while those are some specific things, they're also very general in terms of what I mean for their life. Because I want very specific things for my children. There are certain specific things I'll tell them. Like, for instance, I want you to serve Jesus. But even within that, what I'm not telling my children is, well, you're going to be a pastor, and you're going to be a prophet, and you're going to be a judge. Because that's, that's how we got our kids lined out. Elijah's the prophet. Aaron's the priest. Elena's the judge. And trust me, it works. For our three kids, it works. And we look at them, and, and while we have very specific things that we hope that they will fulfill, we want our kids to serve Jesus with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. We want them to love it. But how they live that out is actually not up to me. How they live that out is actually up to God. I remember when I first thought about going into full-time ministry, I remember my dad pulled me aside one day and me and him sat down and had a conversation. He said to me, he said, Andrew, he says, have I ever pushed you to become a pastor? I said, no. I said, all my life, the only thing I know that you've ever pushed us as your children to do is to love the Lord and serve the Lord. It was up to us in what ways that would happen, but, but you wanted us to just serve the Lord. He said, very good. Now that you've decided that you want to become a pastor, we're going to start working on that. I went, okay. Because now there is a specific purpose. There's a specific calling that wants to be fulfilled in your life. And the same is true for you, that God's looking at you, and you may think that his plan for your life is general, but you have to understand what the Bible says. The Bible says that a man plans his way, but the Lord orders his steps. Every single one. No matter where you go, you cannot go without first taking steps. And you have to take one step at a time to get to the destination that you're trying to get to. Let me show you this in the life of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1 begins. And in Jeremiah chapter 1, God says this to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter, chapter 1, 4 and 5. It says, now the word of the Lord came to me. And this is what God said to him. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. God is giving him a very specific calling on his life. Now, can God get more specific? Yes, he can. But does he? No, he doesn't. God tells Jeremiah, Jeremiah, 
before your parents ever thought about having children, before your grandparents ever thought about having children, before the foundations of the world, I knew who you were. And I already had a plan for your life. And that plan was very specific. And what I did was I took you in your mother's womb. I shaped you. I formed you. And I set you apart for me and my purposes. And that purpose is I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. Man, it's like you look at it and you're like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You called me to be a prophet. Hallelujah. What does that mean? Because here's the thing that I learned. I thought, for me, in my younger years, man, when I become a pastor, it's the pinnacle of what God's called me to do. After I became a pastor, my next thought was, now what? What do I do now? Do I just preach every Sunday and that's it? And then, you know, every, every midweek service, maybe I get an invitation here or there to go to preach in somebody else's church or, or at some event or whatever. Is that, like, is that the end of what you call me to? And, and as I've discovered very quickly after I became a pastor was, was that that was not all God had called me to. That there are many things under the umbrella of pastor that God has called me to and to do. And this is the same for Jeremiah. While God called him to be a prophet and everything he did would flow out of the umbrella of prophet, he didn't just simply be a prophet. And he didn't exactly know how that would play out in his life. He just knew God would speak to him and he would have to go and tell other people about it. Jeremiah is a young boy at this point. So he probably had his own ideas about life and what he wanted to do. He may have dreamt about getting old and uh, uh, growing old, uh, getting married, having a wife, having children. He had his own dreams, his own goals, his own things he wanted to accomplish in his life. And God steps in and God says to him, hold on. I know you've got plans, but I'm going to order your steps. So, so let me show you that I have set you apart. And because I've set you apart, I have to remove you from certain things. You see, that what, that's what setting apart means. That's what consecrating means. Consecrating means to, to just simply set apart. And so God says, I, am, I have pulled you out from among the crowd, from among the group, from among the dreams, the goals, the visions that you have for your life, and I'm putting you over here in the dreams, the goals, the visions that I have for your life. It's not that Jeremiah is not allowed to feel what he feels or want what he wants, but he's saying, Jeremiah, what I've called you to do, I've set you apart, I've taken you away from those things in order that you might fulfill the things that I've called you to. God does the same thing with me and you. He looks at us and he, he, he takes us and he, he transforms us for his glory, for his honor, for his name. You are set apart by God. And before you were ever born, God set you apart. God had a purpose for your life and maybe it wasn't to be a prophet but before you were even in your mother's womb, he knew you. And when you were in your mother's womb, he formed you. And he consecrated you. He set you apart. He put within you everything that you would need to be in order for you to fulfill the plan he has for your life. But what is the purpose? God's main purpose, this is important for us to understand in relation to, to life in general. God's main purpose for your life is that you would know him. That's, his, that's the main purpose that you exist, to know Christ and to make him known. Your main purpose is to have relationship with him. Your main purpose is to walk with God. Why? Because everything else flows out of that. If, if you don't know him first and foremost, if you don't have relationship with him first and foremost, 
It will make it very difficult for you to complete and accomplish the tasks that God gives you because you're not walking with him in relationship. But here's what God does. And can I just be honest with you, Jeremiah, I experienced this, and you possibly have experienced this, and if you haven't, you probably will. It's frustrating, if I'm being honest with you. It's exciting, but it's also frustrating. And what is that? Is that God has a way of revealing the destination, but not the journey. You're going to be a prophet. Oh, fantastic. I'm going to be able to tell people that the Lord said, thus saith the Lord, and you will listen to me because I'm a prophet. But if you know Jeremiah's story, you know that it doesn't work out that way. I was sharing with, a, with, a, with another pastor last night, a meme that I, I saw a few years ago, and it said how young pastors, when they first start the ministry, how they're so excited and they believe they're going to change the world and transform the church and they're going to take everything by storm for Christ and then they nearly get fired in the first week for just trying to change the bulletin. And, and, and I always laugh at it because we look at it and we think, man, like, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm so excited. Yes, I'm going to change the world. And then it doesn't happen the first time. Then it doesn't happen the second time. Then it doesn't happen the third time. It's like, God, did you even call me to this? It's, it's, it, it can be so frustrating sometimes when you're trying to fulfill the purpose that God has for your life because you know that you've heard from the Lord, you feel it in the pit of your gut, yet for some reason it's not working out the way that you think. God has a tendency to tell you about a conclusion but not about the journey that you have to take to get there or to fulfill it. He oftentimes shows you You've, called, you've been called to be a prophet. You've been called to be a pastor. You've been called to be an evangelist. You've been called to do this. You've been called to do that. He shows you, he gives you a vision for the conclusion. What we need to do is hold on to the conclusion, the word that the Lord gives us, but let God write the story. We want to write the story. God, here's what kind of pastor I want to be. Here's what kind of evangelist I want to be. Here's my list, Lord. All the things that, 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 that I want to do and all the things I'm going to accomplish. And Lord, bless it in Jesus' name. And Lord, this is your plan now. I don't care what you had planned before. This is the plan we're going with. And it doesn't work that way. God reveals the vision Hold on to the vision, but let him write the details of the story of your life. Because when we do this, we understand something very important, and we can only allow God to do this if we understand something very important, and that is that his purpose for your life is specific. Most of us think God's flying by the seat of his pants. We're pastor, I don't, I don't really believe that. Yes, you do. Let me tell you how I know you believe that, because of the way you live. We think that God is in the general details of life, not in the specific details of life. And so when I'm struggling with this one very specific thing, whether it's my finances or my marriage or, or, or my children or whatever it is that's going on, that God cares about the big stuff, but he doesn't care about the little small thing. I remember one day there was a lady who said to me, she said, Pastor, I have a headache. I said, let me pray for you. She said, there are people out there who have bigger problems than a headache that need prayer. And I said, yeah, sure, but they're not standing in front of me right now. You are. So I said, so would you like me to pray for you for your headache? And she says, sure. I prayed for her, and the headache went away. And then she said, I didn't think God would do that. I said, what do you mean? She said, it's just a headache. I said, look at how faithful God is to you. That to you, you think, oh, it's just a headache. But to God, 
He cared enough about such a simple detail of your life to heal you from it. My point in telling us this is that God, we think oftentimes, you know, hey, if I'm on the brink of a divorce, God cares about it, but he didn't care about the fight we had last night. We think my children are, are about to, to do some stupid thing in their life that's going to absolutely wreck their life. That's what God cares about, but God doesn't care about the details of their life. Like, hey, they've just got an exam this week, so let me pray for them for the exam that they have to take. Like, like, we think God cares about the really, really big stuff. But the little tiny thing, don't bring that to God. God is in the details of your life. He wants to be in the specifics. And God doesn't give us an incomplete vision or an incomplete purpose, but he can only reveal part of it to us. Paul says we know in part and we even prophesy in part. But one day... It shall be revealed, the perfect shall be revealed, that we will not see in a mirror dimly anymore, but but it, it shall all be revealed to us. You will only know in part in this world, no matter how good of a prophetic gift you have. You will only ever know in part. But God knows the entirety, and he knows all the details. And if we trust him, then we trust him knowing that he's worked it all out. So, if God reveals usually somewhat of a finished product to us, but we haven't reached there yet, how do we get from where we are to that? What do we do in the meantime? And I want, I want you to see four things about purpose and vision. And, I, and I've specifically separated the two. Why? Because purpose and vision are not the same thing. I'll explain it to you in just a second. Purpose, first of all, requires discipline, but vision motivates. So God gives you a vision that motivates you to do certain things, but in order to fulfill your purpose, it requires you to be disciplined in certain things. I'll come back to that and explain what I mean in just a second. Purpose anchors you. It's something for you to to, to hold on to in the middle of the storm. It's something that that I've got to do right now in the midst of what I'm facing and what I'm going through. But vision evokes awe and releases your imagination. So God shows you something about your life. I've called you to be a pastor. I've called you to be an evangelist. I've called you to be a prophet, a teacher. Whatever it is God's called you to do, immediately your mind goes to start imagining what that's going to be like. You start imagining the purposes and the plans that God has for you. You start, it releases your imagination to to, to start thinking about things that could possibly happen. Purpose is the reason you live. Vision is the song your heart sings. So, So what purpose does is purpose every single day. I've got to get up. I've got to do this. It's my reason for carrying on today. It's my reason for getting out of bed this morning. But vision is that song that your heart sings that, man, even though it's a tough day today, I'm going to still sing my songs of praise to the Lord. I'm going to still lift up his name. I'm going to still worship him. Even though I'm going through the, the, the mud right now, even though it is difficult right now, I'm going to trust him. And I'm going to sing that song to the Lord because he's worthy. Purpose gives meaning. Vision prompts action. You see, when we, when we don't have a vision, as a matter of fact, Habakkuk says, it says, write the vision and make it plain so that he who reads it will run. It, it prompts action when you have the vision. But without the vision, purpose just feels kind of out there. Like, what am I doing this for? You, you have to have purpose and vision. Purpose gives meaning to what you do because why? I'm doing this because I know God's going to do this. I'm doing this in preparation for what God's about to do. I'm doing this. This is the purpose for why I'm doing this today because tomorrow this vision will be fulfilled. I may not see it today, but, but, but I'm working with the vision God has for me. So, so what do I mean by vision? Vision is that thing that you see down the road. It is for the future, but purpose is the daily work. So let me give you a good example of this. 
Some of us, the vision we have is I want to get married, I want to have a family, I want to have kids. Praise the Lord. That's the vision you have for your life. But the purpose is to do the daily work to become the kind of man or the kind of woman that somebody wants to marry. You hear? That's the difference. So, so you can have the vision of, man, I want to get married. Man, I want to have a family. Man, I want it to be beautiful. But then guess what? You're going to get married, and you're going to have to sustain that marriage. You're going to get, you, you, and before you get married, you've got to do the work. Why? Because the Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Didn't say that he would find a girlfriend. Say he find a wife. So, so, so ladies, you've got to be prepared when he shows up in your life. And fellas, you've got to be prepared when she shows up in your life. You, you've got to do the work beforehand, in the middle, and at the end. It is not just about having a vision, because for those of you who are married, for those of you who have kids, let's face facts. The hard work don't start till you get married. And if you're not committed to every single day doing the things you've got to do, then what happens is, is that the vision that you had for your marriage will flop because you are not doing the purpose that you are in the marriage for. You have a purpose that every day you get out of bed, you've got to do. Whether that's getting up and, and, and doing the hard work and, and, and it's in prayer and in our walk with God, it's in prayer and worship and reading the word and, and getting closer to God and seeking him. But it also means that I've got that vision. God's given me that vision. And here's what happens. The Bible says that without vision, my people perish. Why? Because what happens is, is that we are trying to fulfill a purpose for something that we don't have a vision for. So you start trying to, you start trying to fulfill all kinds of different visions that you don't really have. You ever seen that before? I, I've been there. I've been there where... where, where you don't really have a clear vision of what you want for your life, so you're just kind of doing everything. And what you're doing in that process is kind of wandering aimlessly. That's where some of us find ourselves right now in our walk with God. We feel like we're wandering aimlessly in our walk. But, but God's purpose for your life is very specific. And if you want to know the purpose he has for you, seek him for that. And if you want to know the vision he has for your life, seek him for that. If you want to know what you need to do today, ask God. If you want to know what you need to do tomorrow, ask God. He will reveal to you what you need to know. And if he doesn't reveal it to you, you didn't need to know. I don't like that one, Pastor. I like to know. I like to know what's happening in my life. I like to know the details. I like to be in charge or at least have some say about where I'm going, what I'm doing, and how it's happening. But God says... Do you trust me enough to lead you? As we like to sing that song, Ocean, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Do we mean that? Where I walk upon the waters, wherever you may call me. Like, like God, wherever you call me, Lord, I'll go. Would you go down the street and go and tell somebody, about well, Jesus, I am, um, I, I'm a bit busy right now. I'm trying to prepare lunch. Check back with me in about four or five minutes. But here's the next thing that happens. That God transforms how you see yourself and how you see him. So his purpose for your life is specific, but then he transforms how you see yourself and how you see him. This becomes important in the fulfilling of what God's called you to do and, and in the fulfilling of the transformation process because how you see him reflects how you see yourself. How you view God is reflected upon how you live your life and how you see yourself. You see, seeing God allows you to see your true self. Why? I, I, I'll give you a, one of the clearest examples in my life of this, and it was the moment of salvation for me and a moment of transformation for me where I was looking at God, feeling dirty, feeling, feeling shame, feeling unworthy of God's love and grace and mercy. And every time I would feel conviction, 
I would think it was guilt. What I mean by that is this, is, is not guilt from the perspective of that I'm guilty of my sins. I know I'm guilty of my sins. But guilt from the perspective of that God wanted to punish me. And so every time I'd feel convicted, I would begin to see God as a judge. I would begin to see God as wrathful. I would begin to see God as condemning. And while I knew the verse, that God did not send his son into this world to condemn it, but that the world might be saved through him, it meant nothing to me until the moment where God showed me that what I felt was not him rejecting me, but what I felt was him actually calling me to come closer to him. And when I saw that, it changed the way I both saw God and saw myself. Because I didn't see myself anymore as simply being dirty and shameful and run out of his presence. I now saw myself as a child of God who was loved by him, who was called by him, who had purpose, and that I was not just simply there for God to go, all right, you're on the list to go to hell, so see you later. But instead, I saw myself now as a son, as one who was loved by him and welcomed by him into his loving arms. It was mind-blowing to me that God would ever want to embrace me in his arms. I felt the guilt of the cross. When I say that, what I mean is I felt like I was the one at the cross just, just, just hammering the nails into Jesus' hands, piercing him in his side. Like, like, there's no way I can be forgiven. And when I took my eyes off of myself, I realized that, yes, it was my sin and my shame that put him on the cross, but that he didn't have to stay there that he chose to stay there because he loved me. That at any moment, as scripture says, that he could have called down legions of angels, but he didn't do that. He stayed on the cross for my sake so that I could be made right with God. And in that realization, I came to this moment where my mind just went, were these things I'd been taught all my life? Yes but they were not things that I knew in my heart. I knew them up here. I could quote scriptures to you. I could tell you that, that God did not come into the world to condemn, but, but to save. Yet, when I would get into his presence, all I would feel would be condemnation, not because he was condemning me, but because anytime I came into his presence, I would feel his presence around me, but I would look inward. I would look to myself. And when I look at myself, all I see is sin and shame. But when I look at him, all I see is forgiveness and mercy and love and grace. Because that's who he is. God lets you see yourself, your true self. And what I mean by your true self is not the way that sin has made you, but the way that he has made you. And that's what God wants you to see because when you receive his son, when God looks at you, he looks at you the way that he looks at Jesus. Because the Bible says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. That Jesus gives us his righteousness and we put it on and we wear it like a cloak. Let me show you this in the story of Jeremiah, what happens here. Jeremiah chapter 1. 6 to 8, and it says, Then I said, this is Jeremiah, this is right after God says, I'll call you to be a prophet. Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth, for to all whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. So what Jeremiah does is he brings up some valid concerns to the Lord. God, I'm just a youth. When it says he's just a youth, it means he's a young boy who is still under his parents' roof and his parents are still responsible for him. We don't know exactly how old he is, but what we do know is that he is a young boy. He's responding with some valid concerns. But I want you to see how he responds 
at some of the things that we see happen here in this and how this transforms how we see ourselves and how God transforms us in the process. First of all is humility. Humility allows us to die to ourselves in order that Christ might live through us. Humility allows us to come into the presence of God and not boast about who we are and what we've done. So what happens here is, if I said to you something absolutely ridiculous, if I said to you, hey, I just want you to kind of give up your spirit and just, just die, and somebody else is going to come and inhabit your body. Most of us would be like, that's crazy, I'm not doing that. No, no way. Yet, Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. He says, I've died to myself. I've, I've died to who I am. I'm, I've died to, to what I have done over the course of my life. And he says, I have given my life to Christ in such a way that, that, that what is happening is that God is living in me and working through me, and it is because of him that I have life. And so he's humble about who he is and what he does and the way that he lives. Jeremiah here is humbly talking to God, and he's saying, God, I'm not just making excuses here. I have concerns. And let me tell you something about your call that is critical for you to walk in it, is that God is not seeking you to be confident in what he calls you to. He's not, he's, he does not want you to be confident in what he's called you to, meaning that you're not supposed to just simply get up and walk out and be like, oh, well, God called me to be a pastor, so ha I'm the pastor. And he says, that's not how it works. The Bible even goes as far as to say that God will exalt the humble and he will humble the proud. Because what God is not looking for are people who can boast in themselves and boast about who they are and all that they can do and all that they've done. That's not what God's seeking. He's seeking people who are confident in him, confident in what he can do, confident in what he has done, confident in what he has said. The next thing in this is, is that we have spirit living. What does this mean? Your flesh, when I say flesh, what I mean by that is your sinful self, the part of you that desires sin, the part of you that desires the opposite of what God desires for your life. It wants you to live one way, but the Spirit of God wants you to live another. The Holy Spirit wants you to live according to God's standard, according to God, the way God has outlined and the way that God has called and created us to live, which is different. Galatians talks a lot about this comparison between what the works of the flesh are and the works of the Spirit are, the fruit of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit. But what God does is God allows you to be able to, by his Holy Spirit, to not gratify the desires of the flesh, your sinful self, your sinful nature, but instead to live and walk according to the Spirit of God and do the things that God has called you to do. You can't do the things that God's called you to do walking in your flesh. That doesn't mean that you can't do good things. Jesus said, he said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more is, is, can your heavenly father? Like, he's so much better. So if you do evil and you're still capable of doing good, he says, that's not quite the point. The point is to live by the Holy Spirit. And God enables you through his Holy Spirit to live in the Spirit. That can only happen when, God tra when we are transformed in the way we see him. Then it's faith living. What does that mean? Jeremiah says it this way. He says, I, I have no training. I have no ability. I have no, 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 no backup, no talent in speaking. Because, hey, I don't know about you guys, but I take it as a big deal to say, God says. That's a big deal. If you, if you put behind anything after that, God says, that's a big deal. 
You're speaking on behalf of the Lord. You're saying that the God of the universe has said something. You, you, you want to make sure that you get that right. And yet, his youth, according to him, is a problem. Why? Because it would be very difficult to take him seriously. It would be very difficult to take a child like him seriously. But faith allows you to take your eyes off of yourself and off of what everyone else will see in order to see God and to do what God has called you to do. But that requires faith. The Bible says that God would give us a spirit of boldness, that the Holy Spirit is a spirit of boldness. As a matter of fact, it even goes as far as to say that that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That's what the Holy Spirit is to us. The Holy Spirit enables us to live by faith. And when you take your eyes off of yourself and fix them on God, it allows you to live by faith. Then, last but not least, we are pre-prepared vessels. Now, what do I mean by pre-prepared vessels? God told Jeremiah in chapter 1, he said, he said, before you were born, I knew you, I formed you, I called you, I made you, I know everything about you, Jeremiah. You're going to be a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was pre-prepared for what God called him to do. We are God's vessels. We are called by God. We're, we're his vessels, and he fills us with what he chooses to fill us with. And because he fills us with what he chooses to fill us with, we oftentimes have a tendency to view ourselves as an independent entity from God. And so God is with Jeremiah. God says to him, Jeremiah, don't be afraid about your youth, because even though you're a youth, and even throughout the course of your life, no matter where you go, who you encounter, as long as you're doing what I've called you to do and doing what I've asked you to do, I will be with you, and I will protect you, I will deliver you, I will help you in times of trouble. And he says, Jeremiah... <clears throat> What I want you to know is that I've prepared you for this purpose, and because you are prepared for this purpose, and you were prepared beforehand, I want you to understand that I'm going to be with you wherever you go, with whatever happens. But because we are vessels, what do vessels do? Vessels hold things. John 15, Jesus said, you abide in me and I abide in you. If you are in me and I am in you, we, we are the vessel of the Lord. God fills us with himself. He fills us with good things. He fills us with his Holy Spirit. He is our vessel of salvation and we are a vessel of his grace. So we have to be in him in order to receive salvation, in order to have salvation. But in order to have salvation, he also has to be in us. But in order to fulfill the work and the call and the purpose that God has for your life, it requires that you have him inside of you, filling, him as, filling you as a vessel of grace. The work we do flows from that. Let me show you it in Scripture, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You were created for good works, which God prepared beforehand, because you're a pre-prepared vessel, that we should walk in them. Romans 8 tells us that the Holy Spirit lives in us. This is, this is what the Bible is trying to get us to see. If you want what God has called you to do, you have to take your eyes off yourself. You have to take your eyes off of yourself and put them on the one who created, called, and purposed, and equipped you. Because when you look at yourself, all you see are your deficiencies, your problems, your issues, what's going on right now. My life is falling apart. But when you look at him, all those things melt away. All those things fade away. And let me just encourage you with this a little bit. It's okay to struggle through your purpose. It's okay. God in his grace has given us a grace that allows us to struggle through the purpose and the plan that he has for us. Just read Jeremiah's story and you see it. We, we've seen it already with Jonah. We've seen it already with Hosea. We've seen it already with Jacob. 
And in his grace, he allows us to struggle with the things that he calls us to. There's grace to struggle in the purpose of God. Thank God for that. Jeremiah struggles with God, but he also struggles with the kingdom that he's in, the kingdom of Judah. He's in the southern kingdom, if you remember. Thought that the kingdom was divided into two kingdoms. Jeremiah is in the southern kingdom. I encourage you to read the book. It's an incredible book. But he's burdened, incredibly burdened in his life by the constant opposition that he's facing. Every turn he makes, every word he gives, everything that just seems to be happening, it's like, man, I'm just constantly coming up against opposition. And when this happens, as Jeremiah continues to battle these things, God speaks to Jeremiah. And he says, Jeremiah, I want you to go to the potter's house. And here is where the story shifts a little bit. And here's what I want you to take away from this before we continue, is that you need to throw your clay on the potter's wheel to be transformed. We, we don't really, we, we, we still have pottery today, but, but we don't see it as much as they did in the ancient world. When we went to Guatemala, there's a, a beautiful place uh, around Lake uh, Atitlan, I think it's called. And it's this beautiful lake, massive lake. There's all kinds of volcanoes and mountains around. And you take a boat and you go across, and as we're going across, there's, there's a little small town on the edge, at the foot of a mountain on the edge of the water. And you go in there, and when you go in there, they're there making pottery. They're making plates and cups and jugs and all this stuff. And it's absolutely beautiful to see. And this is where God sends Jeremiah to the potter's house to see what the potter is making and see what the potter is doing. And, and, and this act right here that we're talking about, the throwing your clay on the potter's wheel, this is one of the greatest acts of humility you will ever do because what it does is it says, to, it says, God, I'm giving myself to you in order for you to transform me. And I want you to see this, Jeremiah 18, 1 and 2, and it says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord was this, arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. This is important. Because sometimes God has to move you from where you are and from who you're surrounded by and what you're surrounded by in order to help you see him better. Sometimes where you are is the issue. Sometimes what you're surrounded by is the issue. And what, where you are, what you're feeling, the situation that you're so close to is hindering your view of him sometimes. If God moves you, though, be careful that you don't misunderstand why God has moved you and why he's doing what he's doing in your life. Why? Because he's always wanting you to see him more clearly in your life. I went to New York a few years ago for, just before COVID for, for a conference. And while I was there, it was around this time of year. It was like October, November. And of course, New York is very different from Cayman in terms of weather, so it was cold. And I walked outside and as I looked around, when I, when I got in, it was the middle of the night, so I could see nothing. When I, when I got to my hotel, it was pitch black, couldn't see anything. The next morning, I got up, and, I'm, and I walk out of the hotel, and as I look around, I'm like, why is all the trees dead? I realized after that, the trees weren't dead, it was fall. We're in Cayman, we don't have fall. You just got tree branches that fall, but you, you, don't, have, you don't have fall the season. And everything is brown, and all the leaves are coming off the trees, and, and, and I'm looking at it. And if you're not careful, you can misunderstand the season that God has you in and in the seasons that God is moving you through. Because what can happen is, is, that, is that the season of your life begins to change, and you look at, at the leaves that are falling, you go, oh, well, I guess it's time to die. This is a dying season. This is, this is, this is you know... Uh, just what it is. But what you don't understand is that it's a process. And that what God is doing is that he's changing your season so that he can lead you into another season because there's a spring that is coming that you will spring forth from, but you first have to go through the fall in order to get to the spring. 
And when we don't understand what God is doing, when God begins to move us, we begin to go, God, why are you doing this? Why are all the leaves of all these beautiful things that you brought in my life falling off? Because it's distracting you from what I want you to see. God always wants you to see him more clearly. And so God says to Jeremiah, or it says in Jeremiah 18, 3 and 4, so I went down to the potter's house. He followed what God said. And there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled. It was ruined in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. Potters don't make junk, but they have a very specific vision for what they're trying to create. They don't make junk, but they have a specific vision in mind for what they're creating. And sometimes in the process of making that thing, what happens is, it, it, is that it gets spoiled because the clay wasn't perfect. It gets spoiled because they didn't remove enough of the air from the clay. It gets spoiled because maybe it was too wet or maybe it was too dry. Or, or maybe there's something in it, some kind of foreign matter that's in it that's, that's messing it up. Maybe it was too heavy, or, and so it, as it began to be shaped, it, it began to sag and lose form as it was trying to make it into something different. Let me tell you, the problem is not that the clay was messed up. That was not what the problem is. The problem is, is that the clay does not have the vision for what the potter is trying to make it into. It just has to simply form itself and be molded by the hands of the potter. It just needs to be transformed by the one who has molded it and is making it into something beautiful. But as long as the clay thinks, oh, well, that's not what I want to be. That's what happens to me and you. It is that we are the clay, and he is the potter, and he is molding and making us. We don't have the purpose. God has the purpose, and he gives it to us. We don't know the vision. We, we just know what God has shown us. We don't know what he's trying to transform us into. We don't, we don't know how he's trying to mold us. We don't know why he's pushing at this particular point in our lives. We don't know why he's rubbing this part. We don't know why this part feels uncomfortable for us. We know we were made for more. We know we can be something beautiful. But right now we're just a lump of clay and we need him to mold us and make us into what he wants. We start to be formed. And in the process of being formed, we mess up. And we know we messed up. And we think, oh, I guess I can't be a beautiful pot. So he's going to throw me away. Surely God will throw me away now. But I want you to see what he said. And he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. It pleases God that when what he's trying to make us doesn't work out. It pleases him to mold and make us again. Not to throw us away, not to discard us, not to destroy us, but instead to mold us again until we become the vision and can fulfill the purpose in which he is currently shaping us for. So Jeremiah 18, 5 to 6 says, then the word of the Lord, this is, God hasn't spoken to Jeremiah yet. Jeremiah sees all of this. And then the word of the Lord came to me. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. You may be looking at your life today and thinking, oh, man, I've messed it up. God doesn't love me. God doesn't want me. No, God wants to transform you. And right now, he might be kneading the bubbles out of your life. 
Right now, he may be shaping you. Right now, he may be molding you. Right, right now, you might be sagging because you're too heavy. Maybe, maybe you're too wet or too dry. Maybe, maybe there's something else that's going on that's causing you to be misshapen from what you know he's creating you to be. But that's okay. It pleases him to mold you and make you again because he still wants you to be his vessel. He still wants you to be his vessel, which he will use for his purpose, because pottery is messy. You can't be a potter without the mess. And it takes time to create something beautiful, but when you're done, it's valuable. And the potter must be patient in the process as they look for consistency in the thickness of the vessel. But when it's done, it's beautiful. And once the potter is satisfied with the shape of the clay, it's then dried for several days. And then what they do is they place it in a kiln, like an, a big oven basically, where it is heated to a temperature of over 2,000 degrees. And this process takes what was once a soft, pliable, weak, breakable clay, and it makes it into a strong, hard, and even stone-like substance. And then after it comes out, the material is cooled and glazed, and then it's put back in to the kiln again. And when it's done, the result is a beautiful piece of pottery that has endured the test of the fire. God is molding and making you today into something beautiful, and I understand that that sometimes is a difficult process. Sometimes it, sometimes it hurts. But I want you to understand something. God doesn't put you in the fire to harden you because he wants to harden your heart. The reason he puts you in the fire is to set in stone what he has made and created you to be. When I hear that, I think of the verse that says that when we are in the hand of God, that we cannot be moved. That, that as long as we are the vessels in his hands, being shaped and molded and made by him, that when he is done, the change becomes permanent. There's no going back to what you were before, to how it was before, to the, the situations of life and, and the way that I lived before, there's, there's no going back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No going back. No going back. I'm changed forevermore now. So today, you may feel like a big lump of clay, like your life is a mess, like you, you don't have much shape, you don't have much vision or purpose for your life, but I'm telling you today, you don't need to know what God's making you into. You just need to trust the hands of the potter to form and make and mold you into what he wants to make you into. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you this morning for this message. I thank you for this word. I thank you, God, that you are bringing us through the fire, that we may be firm in who you've created and called us to be. That, God, that today is a day of salvation, that today is a, is a time for us, God, to not just simply be a vision that we have created in our own minds and in our own thoughts, but to be the vision that you have for us, to see the call and the purpose that you have for us, God. And Lord, today, so many of us have allowed the enemy, our sinfulness, our own thoughts, our own emotions, to cause us to see ourselves in a different light than the one that you have made us to be. To see ourselves as different vessels than the ones that you created us to be. So God, help us today to see ourselves the way you see us. For the purpose that you see us for. Because Lord, some of us, we see ourselves today as broken and useless. Some of us today see ourselves as, as full of holes that can't hold anything. Some of us see ourselves as the clay that can't possibly be shaped or molded 
into anything at all. But when you see us, God, you have a vision for our lives that says, son, daughter, I've called you to more. You can be more. I can make you more. I can make you a vessel of honor. I can make you a vessel of grace. I can make you a vessel of my mercy. So help us today, God, to trust in you, to, to walk with you, to know you deeply, intimately. To know that, God, you love us and care for us. And that if we simply just trust you and take our eyes off of ourselves and fix them on you, Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, that, Lord, we will live a life that we possibly could never have imagined for ourselves. But it will be the life that you created us to live and have. And we thank you today for that, God.